Oh, my name is Alice Shakina. I am a mediator and I mediate um, divorces and uh, personal injury, uh, workplace conflicts, landlord tenants and breach of contract cases. So sort of across the board. Uh, so it's been really interesting listening to you today. And I, at first I have more of a social question and then I follow up with a little bit more, something more serious. So um, one of the things we always like to ask our guests is what are the things that you like to binge on, on Amazon Prime or Netflix? What are some of the shows that you're enjoying currently? Well, I have uh, been late in the binge watching game, but over the time in the pandemic, I watched Power, which was a very insightful look into the challenges that this young man and his family had in making a life in the drug trafficking business, but also trying to cross over and do something legit. It's been a story that's been told so many times throughout our history of young folks with the talent and skill to do well in the trafficking business, but not having invested that energy and that time and those skills in something more legit and trying to do so, but not being able to because once you're in that life, it's hard to get out of it. So that's one of the ones that I've watched. Um, the other ones have just been sort of short series. I'm watching one now called Them, where it's a African-American family migrating from North Carolina to Compton. It's got some scary aspects to it, but it reminds me of my parents who made the similar trip in the 50s and 60s, making their way to Compton, California, which was at that time mostly Caucasian, white, and the transition and some of the challenges that they had. Those are two that I can think of off the top of my head. Did, have you heard of Unbelievable, which is that show about the girl who falsely claimed rape? Like she had all these people come and then I think she was tried for falsely claiming rape. I don't know if you've heard of that series that's happening. I think it's on Netflix. Is that young lady from North Carolina who had made the false claim against the, the Duke lacrosse team? Is that an extension of, of that? Uh, see, I don't think it's that one. I think they're saying that um, they say something about uh, Colorado or something like that. So, yeah. I haven't seen that one. The other one I, I forgot that I just finished, it wasn't so much binge watching because it was sort of fly, was Snowfall, which was a really good series about South Central Los Angeles and what the crack epidemic did to a whole generation of people in the 90s. And when I left Compton in 1983, make my way up here to go to Cal, and going back home and visiting with folks, I saw my whole neighborhood change. And watching that show, John Singleton was the producer, rest in peace. He was one of the folks who grew up in that area as well. You know, the work he did in um, Boys in the Hood and Trading on Day, all of those things. He did a really good job of depicting not so much of the drug trafficking and crack cocaine epidemic, but what it did to families and how it, it literally knocked out a generation of, of men and women who, because of their addictions, weren't able to be fathers and mothers. And we were left with a lot of young folks who I think are still suffering from that void and going through their own personal post-traumatic stress disorder. But that show was a really good documentary on what it was like living in South Central in the late 80s and 90s when we experienced that crack epidemic. I have a question about <clears throat> a show. I don't know, have you heard of Bridgerton? It's a very popular show. I've heard of it, yeah. I've heard of it. I've seen little pieces of it here and there. There's a scene in that uh, series that a lot of people are in sort of pop culture have been talking about it being a rape scene. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard of it. And I just, I wanted to know from your expertise um, if that rape scene is really a rape scene. So basically um, the, the couple, they are a couple and they're having sex just like any couple would, except he doesn't want to get her pregnant. So he pulls out, but she doesn't want him to do that. So she like stops him from doing that against his will. And there are a lot of people who are very upset with that scene. And then suddenly they don't like that character anymore because they're claiming that the woman is basically raped the man by doing that against his will. And I'm curious on technicalities, is that something that would stand up in court? Um, you know? It's a good question. It is then a question for a long time. There was 
a belief biologically based that a man cannot have an involuntary erection. And therefore, for a man to become erect, the idea of whatever he's about to do has to be consensual because otherwise, why would that happen? I believe that that's no longer accepted as, as, as credible or as empirical because you can have an erection that is not intent on having sex. And if, however, someone forces you to, I believe you could conceivably based on the elements of sexual assault having sex with someone that's not consenting to um, you having sex with them or performing a sexual act on them. I don't see it. I haven't seen much of it, but in my experience, in my understanding of the elements of sexual assault, you could conceivably have a woman charged with forcing a man to engage in sex against his will. Even if it's like halfway through, like the first part of it, he was, it was consensual. It's the part where he wanted to pull out and she didn't let him is where the suddenly the wills changed, right? He suddenly didn't want it and she did. But prior to that moment, it was consensual. Well, it makes it complicated. And that's why this area of law is so challenging. Because as you could imagine, I've seen a lot of cases on the flip side where a young lady who's accusing a man of having sex with her against her will will say that, yes, I kissed him. And yes, we made out. And yes, we, you know, we had this intimacy. And even he was penetrating me and then I didn't want it to happen. And I said, stop. Now, for a man to understand and recognize that that means stop right there and that means no longer consensual is a challenge. Um, biologically, mentally, and all the things that we know about intimacy. But technically and by the law, once the moment happens and the words are said, no, no more stop, then that starts the, that's when you cross the line into the elements of sexual assault. Leading up to it is what we would call mitigating factors. Well, person in that position reasonably would have been thinking that this was still going on. But then you got to dig into the layers of perceptions of sex and what that means, and intimacy. Um, you probably had to imagine that a lot of folks will say that's part of what happens. That happens with people in consensual sex all the time. Sometimes they're engaged just to get it over with, and it's not necessarily force of fear. It's just submission. It's submission against the law. It is... It, is thick with layers and why it is important to have these conversations in public and with people, particularly young people, men and women, because somebody's going to have sex tonight on campus and they're going to be confused about what happened. And to understand what the possible criminal repercussions could be is important. 